to talk to you today about DNA repair. Of course, it's much more fun if I can see your faces, but unfortunately, that's how it will be. So I will be trying to imagine you while I'm talking. So I think because of all these technical issues, let's maybe do the questions at the end. Yeah. So I would say that uh, DNA repair is a very big topic, and uh, usually it's a kind of a subject for the whole big course. So today we will just talk a little bit about what DNA repair is about and what is the relation of this uh, subject of this whole field to the human health, uh, to human disease and why I believe this is something of uh, everybody's interest. Um, I guess I will start uh, with the idea and I'm not sure why I'm not able to, just one second. Uh -huh. I will start with the idea that DNA is a very important uh, molecule and it's extremely important that uh, DNA is not um, damaged because all kinds of uh, DNA damages uh, can lead to problems and especially all kinds of uh, damages. Tuck. Just one second, for some reason I'm not sure if my slides are not being going forward. I think, just one second. Probably I need to go back to just to see because for some reason they are, they are stalled and I'm not sure why. Just one second, I'll try to do it again. Stop sharing and I will, sorry guys, I'll just try to share again. So share screen. There, okay, let's see. Hmm. No, it's not going forward. Dark, okay. So, okay, let me do this share screen and um, dark. Okay, just, I'm, I'm really sorry, just I'll try to start this again because for some, re for some reason I cannot put this forward. Um, dark, okay, okay. Now I think it's better. So, okay, yes. So I told you that all kinds of problems with DNA molecule can lead to problems. And it's very, very important that lesions that happen in DNA uh, will be repaired. And if lesions in DNA, in DNA will be repaired, then we will get back our nice intact DNA molecule. And therefore we will have, uh, we will have a healthy cell. However, if lesions in DNA will not be repaired, then uh, either the cell will die because, for example, DNA can be destroyed, or if we get a bad repair, and we will talk today a little bit about this idea of bad repair, then mutations will result from that. And mutations can lead to either birth defects, which is a big problem if you understand, of course uh, you understand, or mutations can lead to other problems, to various diseases, uh, for example, to cancer. Of course, everything depends on where exactly mutations happen. Because uh, if mutations will, help, uh, will happen in germline, we can imagine that this can lead to birth defects, right? But the question is always whether or not mutations in somatic cells is a problem. Usually you would imagine that who cares because we're talking about multicellular organisms, but uh, sometimes we do care because some mutations lead to cancer and that's a big problem. So we will talk about this as well. One thing that I always mention when I'm talking about mutations, I am talking about the fact that mutation is not one step process. So usually DNA lesion does not lead right away to mutations. Many things really have to go wrong. I will just quickly go through this slide and tell you just what can go wrong. So first of all, as I just mentioned, DNA damage can happen. So either the damage ha happens inside DNA or we get bad nucleotides damaged nucleotides that get inside the DNA. So these lesions, as I mentioned to you, can be repaired, but if repair does not happen, then we usually get to replication problems. So we're not right away go to mutations. Usually damaged DNA is leading to replication problems. And in replication problem, we can have all kinds of problems. And if I have time later, I will stop on this a little bit. But what I want to emphasize now is even that is not the end of the game. Because even after that, we still have a chance for repair. It's called 
post replicative repair, and that's a kind of last chance. And if we are not even here repaired, then mutations will come from that. So in other words, mutation is a combination of many things going wrong, DNA damage plus errors in repair plus replication problems. Let me first, before I will talk about DNA repair, let me talk a little bit about DNA damage. Of course, again, that could be taught for many, for many different days and months, but I'll just try to give you some of my favorite examples. So first of all, uh, I have to say that many types of damages can happen, and they actually can result from either exposure to exogenous sources, and that's probably what you really are familiar with, because you definitely all know that, for example, exposure to sunlight, which is a source of UV, can lead to UV damage, right? Or, let's say, smoking can lead to DNA damage, or exposure to various kind of uh, radio things like x-rays or ionizing radiation can also damage DNA, or various chemicals. So we all know about this thing. But I want to emphasize that this is not the only source and not even the main source, because even inside of our cells, we have a lot of causes of DNA damage. For example, oxidative damage results from normal oxygen metabolism, and we all have it inside our cells. Therefore, some sources of DNA damage are absolutely inevitable. They do happen. No, and the last thing I will say that people, when people are doing experiments in their labs, they kind of talk about spontaneous mutagenesis and induced mutagenesis. Induced usually comes from all kinds of things that we can actually expose the cell to, and spontaneous comes from all kinds of normal things that we really don't know what they're coming from, right? So now I think it would be better if I just give you some examples before we talk about repair. Just examples of what happens to our cells every day. This is the most uh, norm normal and the most known type of DNA change, right? It's a type of DNA damage. It's called depurination or depromidination. So it's basically a situation when we simply lose the base. So as this is a very primitive uh, picture of DNA, just one strand of DNA right here. So I uh, just will remind you that we have bases here, right, attached to sugars. And bases, of course, are very important because bases are really determining the code, right? So it's a specificity of bases that are responsible for the uniqueness of our genetic code. So once in a while, what happens is just due to the normal reaction of hydrolysis, there is a breakage of this bond that uh, keeps together the base attached to the sugar. And if that bond is broken, we get so-called abasic site. So uh, in this situation, the DNA is intact, so we don't have any breakages in this phosphodiester bonding. But if replication comes to such a place, it will be very confused because there is no base here. Uh, usually we have depurinations. Depurinations happen a hundredfold more often than depurinations. And if you look at this uh, frequency, it doesn't look that scary because it's just three to 10 to the minus 11 events per base per second uh, under physiological conditions. But if you will translate it to our cells, it will mean 10,000 as of depurination events per day in a human cell. So really, while we're all sitting here and listening to my lecture, this is happening all the time. And that's a bad event because if we need to do replication or transcription in this place, it's going to be a problem. Uh, another, my favorite example of damage that I will be getting to today, uh, I will be really talking about this a little bit more, uh, it's a reaction of deamination. So it also looks pretty simple. So if you imagine cytosine, which is uh, one of our bases, right? And if we lose this amino group of the cytosine, and replace it by oxygen, and this can happen as a, re as a result of this just normal hydrolysis, what will happen is that cytosine will be transformed into uracil. And uracil, as you know this, it's also base, but not a normal one, not the normal in the DNA, right? Uh, another example is that if we take now modified cytosine, methylcytosine, and also deaminated, this will be transformed to another base, which is thymine. 
So basically, these are very, very simple reactions that happen quite often in our cells. And uh, what are the consequences of this? Well, if we do not repair this, then the consequence will be that if you start from CG pair, right, and you do dimination of this cytosine, you get uracil here, then in next replication uh, and uh, across from this uracil, we will get insertion of adenine because uracil, it basically works like thymine. And if you get this, then in the next replication, what you get is that at least this adenine will definitely lead to mutation. This also most likely will, but adenine across from adenine thymine, and as a result, you get a mutation, that so-called transition from CG, you get to TA. Uh, if you get uh, methylcytosine, it's the same thing that you kind of have instead of methylcytosine, thymine here, right? And real result will be also CG to TA. And if I will be right now in, in front of your class, I will definitely ask you right now, unfortunately I cannot ask you, but imagine I do. So I will ask you what is worse, this situation or this situation, because the outcome is the same, but what is worse, domination of cytosine giving you uracil or domination of this methylcytosine that gives you thymine. I hope you had a second to think about this. And when I ask my class, uh, we usually have two opinions, of course. This is worse or this is worse. And right away, I have to tell you that definitely this is worse. The situation of methylcytosin is worse. Why? It's worse because it gives you no chance for repair, right? Because right from methylcytosin, you get thymine. And thymine is a completely normal uh, base in our DNA, right? It cannot be recognized. It looks absolutely normal. And therefore, it will right away lead you to mutation. In the case of uracil, it's different because uracil is not a normal part of our DNA. It is not supposed to be in the DNA. And therefore, if cells will be smart, they really can go and find this uracil and reverse the situation. They can repair that. And therefore, we do have a hope here and we do not have a hope here. And the good illustration of this idea is uh, the illustration of uh, the uh, locus, just one particular gene in bacteria. This is, was done a long time ago. When people just analyzed and looked where are the hotspots for mutations in this gene. And turned out that specific positions where cytosine is uh, transformed to this methylcytosine, where it's methylated, are the hotspots, meaning that uh, and the frequency of change is the same, the frequency of domination is the same, but inability to repair really creates a hotspot. I think this is a pretty good illustration of the idea that repair is really the most important thing. So of course damage and the pr probability of damage is important, but it's absolutely crucial to repair. Kind of going forward with this example, I, I just like the example of domination, going to kind of bring a couple of other things, a couple of other additions to that. Uh, so uh, one will be this one. So um, what uh, usually I'm asking my students what it is, they tell me that, well, this is immunoglobulin. And in our cells, in B cells, uh, there is this constant formation of new uh, antibodies and what it requires, it requires a change that will occur in immunoglobulin locus. So there are many different mechanisms that are responsible for diversification of antibodies. So really our cells are trying to make a lot of different types and that as I said, there are many mechanisms, but one I want to kind of mention here is a very high mutation level that happens in that locus. So just for illustration here, normally the level of mutations is one to 10 to the minus nine for normal position in normal gene. But for the frequency uh, associated with this antibody diversification, the frequency of mutation is in immunoglobulin locus is one to 10 to the minus three. So you, we're talking about a six, uh, uh, so basically we're, we're talking about, yeah, this um, million times more often than here. And how is it achieved? 
it's achieved by mutations on purpose. Basically, there is this very interesting enzyme that is called activation-induced cytosine deaminase, or AID, which is doing this deamination that I just told you about on purpose. So it's basically specifically deaminates cytosines, creates uracils, and the situation is made in the cells in such a way that it's not repaired. And this leads to very high level of mutagenesis. And this is supposed to be good, right? Because we get diversification of antibodies. What is pretty scary though, is that uh, this AID uh, could also be dangerous for our cells. Because if AID creates mutations uh, normally in this uh, uh, immunoglobulin locus, this is good. This is for diversification of antibodies. But when suddenly it gets expressed in other places, for example, it will attack other genes that are not immunoglobulin genes, or if it will be expressed in completely other cells, we will get mutations and chromosomal rearrangements. And very importantly, AID is often overexpressed in cancers. So it kind of shows you a kind of bad and good things about DNA damage, possibility of repair, and the outcomes. So they could be good and could be bad. To two more examples of damage I will give for you and we will go forward to repair. Uh, one, of course, you know very well is UV light. And I'm sure you heard about the fact that UV light uh, is a very common source of mutations. And the reason for that is that by UV, uh, UV attacks positions of two thymines in the DNA and creates covalent bonds between them. And this, of course, is bad because there should be no bonding between bases that are sitting next to each other. And this will confuse uh, replication. This will confuse DNA polymer polymerase. It might either stop here so replication will stall or it can put a wrong base across from this uh, dimer. So that's uh, one type of thing that I wanted to mention. And maybe the last thing I want to mention will be ionizing radiation. So ionizing radiation, of course, we can imagine it. there are many sources of that, starting from terrestrial radiation. For example, radon is a source. Going to all kinds of things. For example, you can get exposed on the plane, during your chest x-ray exam or other things. And the reason I like the example of ionizing radiation is that differently from UV, this one can cause many different types of damage. So UV is causing just one, but ionizing radiation creates lots of things, for example, oxidative damage. But there is one type of uh, damage that is very specific for ionizing radiation. It's creating of breaks, creation of various breaks, including breaks in the backbone, including breaks in uh, this uh, phosphate sugar backbone of the DNA. So it's a breaks in DNA. I guess it's enough about damage. Uh, and I think I, now I really want to talk about repair because uh, as I told you, it's very important that any damage that happened is repaired either right away or at least later, later on uh, after already we got some problem in replication. So because we have uh, many possibilities of repair and many different types of, types of problems, there are many pathways of DNA repair. And I kind of like this slide, it's already 2020, but since 2015, I really love that slide, uh, kind of emphasizing that at least once uh, in our history, right, a uh, Nobel Prize was given to DNA repair. It will be, of course, better if uh, each of these people, uh, person, so each of these pathways of DNA repair will get their own Nobel Prize, but this one was divided between three different pathways of DNA repair and specifically between three different scientists that were responsible for these pathways. In reality, really for each of these pathways, many, many scientists work for that. So it's a whole field kind of got the Nobel Prize five years ago. So I will just talk a little bit about these pathways that got the Nobel Prize and about the importance of these pathways and why actually they were recognized by such an important prize.
So I'll start with this one. It's called nucleotide excision repair that discovered by Aziz Sankar and actually by quite many other scientists, but he got the prize. And that is the one that really is responsible for repairing of UV-induced damage. So I told you that UV, even though UV is responsible for a lot of damage and actually a lot of cancers, uh, it's doing only one thing. It creates the dimers between thymines, like thymidine dimers. Uh, so what really is the pathway to repair? I'll show you this first on the example of bacteria because that's where it was discovered and that's where it's very simple and really easy to appreciate. And of course, eukaryotes, as usually it happens, does it do it more or less the same way, but in many different variations. So in bacteria, what happens is that you have a, uh, this uh, complex of these two proteins, UVRB and these two UVRAs. And what they're doing, they're basically going like caterpillars through the whole DNA. And they simply do it looking specifically for this TT dimer. So this is the one that's created by UV damage. And this caterpillar will just go through the DNA find the place where that happened. And once they find that place, basically they do all kinds of funny things like this bind, this kinking of the DNA, stabilization of the complex. Of course, I'll not go with details, just the idea. And then basically what happens is that UVRB opens that little place and then a special other enzyme comes, gets a nix here, Nick here, and then UVRD, another protein comes, and here is what it is doing. It's removing one strand that is damaged, and then a polymerase comes, and now it will use another strand that is not damaged and will do resynthesis. So basically, we will do like this, and ligase will come and ligate this. The reason I like that pathway and like this example is because it really illustrates the principle, even though there are many, many different damages and pathways, but that really illustrates how the majority of different DNA repair pathways work. They excise one strand that is damaged and then use the fact that the DNA has two strands and hopefully another strand is fine and just resynthesize. And I would say, even if you don't know any other pathways, you can really guess how things work. We kind of always find the damage, remove it and resynthesize. That's the idea. So uh, in humans and just in eukaryotes and including humans, it works more or less the same way. We have a surveillance complex that is looking for the damage. It brings very similar types of proteins. And then we also do some leaking and resynthesis. So I'll not go through steps. The basic idea is here. Of course, in, high euk in eukaryotes, there are other interesting complications. For example, it has this uh, way of bringing the this complex specifically to the places of transcription. It's so-called transcription coupled repair because the idea is that our cells have so much DNA that just we cannot rely on this caterpillar to go through all of the DNA. We kind of need to repair places that are transcribed first. That's why when transcription machinery just bumps into the damage, uh, we will be able to bring the repair complex right there just to be able to save transcription, to let transcription go fine, and then repair the rest of the DNA. Another thing I want to kind of mention in relation to this pathway, and this is very important point in relation to DNA repair, is that this nucleotide excision repair was one of the first uh, examples that demonstrated to the entire world that DNA repair is extremely important because defects of DNA repair can lead to cancer. It can lead actually to different diseases, but specifically to cancer. So this is example <clears throat> of disease that's called xerodermal pigmentosum. This is a defect of this nucleotide excision repair, and patients are extremely sensitive to sunlight and uh, they are very predisposed to skin cancer. So normally the mean age for skin cancer is eight years. Uh, normally the mean ca is, uh, age is 60 years old in normal population, but in these patients, it's eight years old. So this is very 
early onset of skin cancer. Why? Because we cannot repair the damage and as a result, we accumulate mutations and as a result, some of those ones will hit genes that actually are important to protect us from cancer. Uh, another example I want to mention here is this basic seizure repair. And this will go with my favorite example that I told you when I was talking about damage, this damination, right? Remember I told you that this uracil is better than thymine because uracil can be recognized, right? And that's the thing. So how it's recognized? Well, there is a special glycosylase, it's a special enzyme that's called uracil glycosylase that will specifically also go and look through the entire DNA and specifically it's looking for uracils. Once it finds uracils, it will just remove that base and it will create so-called a basic site or AP site. So it's a site that does not have a base. It's exactly as what I showed you in the situation of depurination. And then a so-called AP repair will come into place. Again, I don't have any time to talk about this in details, but yes, there is a special enzyme that will find this AP sites, cut them, but then exactly the same principle comes into place. We have another strand and we will just go and copy that other strand and we repair this. So, uh, and turns out that many different damages of bases, not just uracil, but all kinds of problems that can happen with them, uh, with bases are solved in exactly the same way. So this is a very short list, it's not even everything, but a kind of list of different glycosylases that we have in human cells. So why there are quite many glycosylases? It's because they are looking for particular types of DNA damage. They, for example, one of them is looking for uracil. Another was looking for specifically oxidated uh, guanazine. So this 8-oxide is what happens with G, with guanine, once it's exposed to uh, uh, oxygen dam to oxidative damage. And all kinds of these things are doing the same thing. They remove that damaged base and then we reduce the situation to this a basic site and then we just use another strand for repair. So it's kind of interesting because what all of that says is that our cells developed a lot of uh, different recognition systems that are looking for the damages that normally happen in our cells. The reason I want to kind of stop here and emphasize this idea is because it kind of helps you to understand why mutagens, why you, you are kind of hearing so much about uh, mutagens, about, about all kinds of chemicals, for example, that can lead to mutations. Those chemicals quite often do exactly the same thing. They modify the base. Uh, and so it's kind of not worse than, for example, creating uracil or to creating, for example, oxidative guanine. But the reason they are so da damaging, the reason they are so dangerous is because our cells did not have yet time in evolution to create the glycosylases that will find them. That's actually the bad thing about them. So uh, we need another, let's say, you know, thousands and more years to really evolve to create special glycosylases that now also will be recognizing this damage and sending them to repair pathways. Okay, the last repair I want to talk about here will be this post-replicative repair. So the, I told you, remember, that there are some that damages that can be repaired right away, but if they're not repaired, then they go to replication, and problems in replication can be addressed by post-replicative repair. And that is the third Nobel Prize that was given to Paul Modric for mismatch repair. And really mismatch repair was also discovered on bacteria. First, because it's, and I like to start with bacteria because it's a very simple case. And there are just three things that mismatch repair machinery is doing. It's finding the bases that are mismatched after application. And then it recognizes and figures which is an incorrect one. And then it excises that one. And again, we resynthesize using another strand. So exactly the same principle, exactly the same simple idea. 
And yeah, in bacteria, it works very simple. So let's imagine that we made a mistake because of the damage or because of just normal replicative problem. We, for example, we put a cross from A, we put a G, for example. So it's a wrong pair. So mismatch repair mute S uh, protein will find this because it does not look like good DNA. It's a distortion here. And then it will bring two of his friends. So it's mute H and mute L. There are three guys here. And these guys will figure out which is the wrong base, will make a cut, and then again, we will have excision and resynthesis using another strand. So the same principle all over again. Uh, and this uh, system was discovered in bacteria a long time ago. But then it turned out that eukaryotes have exactly the same system. The only difference is that there are many homologs of eukaryotic cell, uh, eukaryotic genes. For example, for mutes, it's the, why, the guy who is recognizing mismatches, there are at least six homologs in, in East and quite many in humans. And the same for mutel. For mutage, it works a little differently, but I don't think I can talk about this in such a short lecture. The point is that uh, the same principle, but uh, big diversification, like many complexes. Uh, what was even more interesting and more important was that uh, it turned out, uh, and that happens in 94, when three uh, labs at the same time demonstrated that human homologue of this mutase uh, is extremely important gene uh, in terms of cancer etiology. Because mutations in this gene, if they're inherited, they lead to the disease that's called hereditary non polymposis colorectal cancer. So it's a very serious predisposition position to colorectal cancer. And that was a second example when the problem with DNA repair predisposes patients to cancer, kind of bringing a very, very uh, a big importance to this very basic science. So people were studying this in bacteria and did not really guess that it will be of such a big medical importance. And I would like to maybe spend uh, the last 15 minutes or so of my lecture talking about why these old genes that are involved in repair are so important in cancer development or in cancer prevention, I would say. And what is the overall relation between this DNA repair and cancer? And for that, I guess I need to show you this little wheel that is a kind of, very, many of you probably saw it in this way or another way. What this demonstrates, what this kind of illustrates, these are different uh, hallmarks of cancer. So basically the idea is that uh, in order to, for normal cell to become cancer cell, uh, that cell has to acquire a lot of very unusual properties. Well, for example, it should, for example, become uh, absolutely, it, it, it should acquire this limitless replicative potential. So the ability to replicate indefinitely, right? To live indefinitely. Or it should very much change its growth signaling. Basically, it should become independent for growth signaling from all kinds of cues coming from other cells. And many, many other things should happen to the cell in order to become cancerous cells. But there is one particular hallmark that is very important for the topic that we're discussing today. It's genomic instability. So cancer cells show a very high level of instability in their genomes, a very high level of mutations and chromosomal rearrangement. And why it is important? It's important because a very big level of instability here can bring you all other changes. So if you need to change many genes, really you want instability first, and then you change a lot of genes. Which genes are important here? Again, in a very short way, I would like to just remind you that normal cell, it's constantly is being regulated by various 
positive cues and negative cues. So positive are is the ability to proliferate, right, and ability to survive. So many kind of proteins are required for these positive things. But there are also negative ones. So if really situation gets bad, and if, for example, that cell gets some features that make it dangerous for other for the whole organism, then basically there are ways in the cell to make sure that that cell will actually stop growing or even die. And the cancerous cell, it really becomes autonomous for positive cues, so it's basically now pro will proliferate indefinitely and also will lose these abilities of negative regulations. And because of that, we're, ta we're talking sometimes about genes that are sitting in these positive cues that are regulating positive things as proto-oncogenes because they can be transformed in oncogenes and oncogenes will make the cell kind of autonomous for proliferation and for growth. And we're talking about genes that are uh, in this negative cues, sometimes as tumor suppressors. So cancer cells, if they get mutations in tumor suppressors, this also can help in this development, in this transition from normal cell to cancer cell. So just as an example, for example, genes that promote cell cycle progression, right, they will be potentially becoming oncogenes and they can now, when they become oncogenes, they will promote progression indefinitely. Okay, so kind of uh, finishing this topic, I would like to, I know that it's impossible to read what is here. All I want to say is this, this is a long list of various tumor suppressors and there are several pages. And among tumor suppressors, you can find almost all of these important DNA repair genes that I was mentioning today. For example, mismatch repair genes are here among tumor suppressors. And what happens is that if people are getting, if patients are getting hereditary cancers, then very often as a gene that they inherit from their parents that predispose them to these hereditary cancers will be mut mutations affecting DNA repair. So basically, if they get mutations affecting DNA repair, it will lead to much higher level of mutations, right? For example, if they have defective mismatch repair, they will not be able to eliminate uh, some mistakes post-replicatively, much higher level of mutations, and as a result, changes to many, many other genes, and together we will eventually get this, all of these hallmarks of cancer, and this will lead to cancer. So that's about hereditary cancers. What about sporadic cancers, because some of the cancers are not inherited, they're just developing de novo, just of, because of some sudden events. And in fact, sporadic cancers, they constitute about 95% of all cancers. What about these guys? Looks like here, the problem is not in the inheritance of the DNA repair problems, but in this activation of oncogenes. So it's also some rare mutations that create these uh, oncogenes, basically changes in proteins that now will be actually constantly inducing growth, constantly inducing proliferation. And if this happens, and usually they are dominant because it's a gain of function, it's a new property. And if this is acquired, then the first thing that happens is a very, very active proliferation, very active replication that sometimes leads to DNA damage because replicative origins start working so actively and so dysregulated in such a dysregulated ways that breaks very often happen in the DNA. And when there is such a high level of damage, that leads also to the problem of DNA repair. Because now, even if you have a normal DNA repair, you simply cannot repair properly all of these damages. And as a result, you get to the same outcome. So once you get a problem in DNA repair, you get genomic instability and eventually problems in all different genes and hallmarks of all these cancers. And as a result, actually, we know from the current whole genome sequencing that had been done 
uh, now for many cancers and we just got many papers published uh, not we but uh, in our field um, very recently a very big number of papers was published to characterize 2000 new cancers whole genomes of 2000 new cancers what we know from all these papers is that cancer cells accumulate a lot of mutations and a lot of chromosomal rearrangements and some of them are those that are really responsible for these cancers. Another thing that I wanted to mention, and that relates to the area of my interest and to relate to some very recent findings, is that in cancers, not just mutations are accumulated in very high numbers, not that they are just multiple, but they are often very highly localized. So what you see here is this a new phenomenon that's called cottages, and cottages from Greek language will mean thunderstorms and what this kind of means is that if these are the distances between mutations then usually there are very low big distances between mutations but in some areas of cancer genomes there are areas where mutations are separated by very very short distances so-called clusters of mutations why they're so important? They're so important, and this is actually an example from my study. We are in the East, we are kind of mimicking what happens in cancer. I have no time to talk about this, but the point is that you can mimic these events, what happens in cancer. And what is very important about those events is that you have a lot of mutations in one place, but not that many in other places. Why is it important? It's important because if you will have that many in one place, you have a a very big chance of changing properties of one or several proteins. But at the same time, you also have a very high chance to survive because the rest of the genome is not affected very much. And people are very interested now in the mechanism specifically of these localized events because they seem to be the ones that are promoting cancer. And uh, my lab and quite several other labs around uh, the world are kind of coming to the idea that those localized mutations are usually a combination of several things coming together. And usually it's a particular pathway of repair of breaks in DNA. And we love some particular pathways more than others, but specifically those pathways that create very long strands of DNA, single strands of DNA, in combination of DNA damage that will specifically attack that single-stranded DNA and create this region of mutations. And here, just this is my favorite example, so I guess it's close to the end of lecture. I will show you this example. Who are these damages who are specifically causing these clusters of mutations? These damages, interestingly, are made quite often by our own enzymes that are existing in our body that are called upper backs. It's a very big group of enzymes that are very related to that AID. Remember, at the very beginning of lecture, I was talking about this AID, which is cytosine diaminase that is important for diversification of antibodies. Turns out that this big other group of this big group of upper back enzymes is doing exactly the same thing, these deaminations of cytosine into uracils. And they specifically are doing this in single-stranded DNA. And we have it in our body. Why we have it? We have it because they fight viruses. They are fighting our viruses that are single-stranded DNA viruses, and they are very useful for that. But the negative side of them is that if we get single-stranded DNA inside our own genomes, they will attack those places. And that's why they cause this, uh, if they get access to our chromosomal DNA, they create clusters of mutations, and those clusters of mutations are the ones that lead to this massive genomic uh, instability. And that's really interesting because it's also kind of illustrates the idea of why single-stranded DNA is so bad, because if you make damage there, there is no other strand that will be used for repair. Remember I told you the way to repair is to excise this really area of damage and then to use another strand. If you accumulate single-stranded DNA, you can not do it. So that's why there is now a lot of uh, emphasis on figuring out what are the pathways that accumulate single-stranded DNA. 
but that's completely other story. The last thing I want to mention here is this another type of localized uh, instability event that is also very much interesting and it also happens uh, to accumulate in many cancers. It's called chromatrypsis. Uh, it's again kind of from Greek, right? Basically, it's a pathway that uh, kind of basically pulverize the chromosomes. Chromosomes are shattered in small pieces and the pieces are connected to each other in just wrong way. And there are many ideas of how exactly does this happen, but it's absolutely astonishing because what you're looking at here, you're looking at the chromosome that is rearranged in many, many different ways. Basically, each of these little lines connects the breakpoints of rearrangements that include inversions, translocations, deletions, and many, many bad things. And this is also very dramatic and very highly localized event because it quite often happens just to one chromosome. And that chromosome has changed dramatically and other chromosomes are fine. That's why these things are surviving and leading to really bad cancers. And uh, I would say we believe and quite many other labs uh, believe now that all of that starts with DNA repair because if double stand breaks happen in your genome. Um, I don't think I have time for that, but this is my favorite pathway of, du of double strand break repair. And we believe that if there are breaks in the genome and that particular pathway will repair those breaks, then there is a huge accumulation of single stranded DNA. And also quite many chromosomal rearrangements can result from that, that eventually can lead to all these kinds of uh, rearrangements, including those leading to cancer. And this, I, I think I We'll just finish with not such a dramatic picture, but this is just a picture of one of the cancer genomes. And you can see that even with your eyes that there is a lot of changes to the genome. Uh, there are additions of chromosomes, uh, disappearance of some chromosomes, but most importantly, there is a lot of chromosomal rearrangements. This you see by these different colors in one chromosome. Normally, chromosomes should be having only one color by this method. And really, this rearrangement frequency, higher frequency mutation, higher mutation frequency is a very important hallmark of cancer. And DNA repair on one hand is a very important mechanism to prevent all of these problems. But at the same time, some pathways of DNA repair can create substrates that will be attacked by various damaging agents. And if things are going badly, then actually some pathways of DNA repair can actually lead to mutations and chromosomal rearrangements. That's why I believe that DNA repair is a very interesting double-edged sword that really can do bad thing, good things and bad things. And it's very important to study that. So I guess with that, I will finish uh, my lecture and I can definitely answer questions. I guess I will stop sharing and then I can see some uh, questions. Okay, I guess I'll just open the chat, right? Just, uh, can I see this? Aha, okay. Tag, okay, so uracil definition. Uracil is one of the four nucleases tag, okay. Okay, so yeah, so what is uracil we understand, right? It's one of the bases, right? And normally uracil is present in RNA, it's the base in RNA, so it looks like there is a response here already. Так, uh, so, okay, yeah, it's a good, very good question. Could we, could we use CRISPR to reduce or remove AID? No, AID, I have to say that, uh, in principle, we should not remove it, right? It's very important, but it's important that we actually regulate this properly. Uh, definitely, there is a big interest right now in regulation of APABEX. It's APABEX is a big group of enzymes that are AID-like enzyme. And yes, people actually are thinking about how to target APABEX and how to regulate it. In fact, it's a very interesting topic on its own because one idea is uh, in cancers where, where upper back is overexpressed, actually to make it even more expressed because if you get even more mutations and more breaks, those cancers can be killed by, over, by even higher overexpression. Therefore, you can try to do it both ways, either to kill it or actually to push it further to kill the cells because they will get enormous amount of mutations and rearrangements. So it's a very interesting topic. And I know that some companies now 
are specifically interested in targeting upper backs and AID. Так, um, okay, QRSL definitions, that's, I guess it's all here. Так, let me see. Uh, okay, thanks for the talk. What's your take of microorganisms inducing mutations to cause cancer? So uh, microorganisms, I'm not sure which ones we're talking here about. Definitely one of the very kind of important points of how um, things from outside can induce mutations, uh, I would say I would talk more about viruses probably because the best kind of example will be right now, I guess, is HPV. And HPV is the virus that is definitely known to cause cancers. Uh, and uh, basically it starts from uh, one of the very important things that happened there is uh, after infection with HPV will be induction of upper backs, right? Because upper backs are supposed to uh, kill viruses. But uh, after induction of this upper back, what will happen is the exposure of our normal DNA and formation of all of these mutation clusters and other things. So now people are actually studying very much this, how uh, initial infection by, with HPV can lead to result, in, result uh, can result in cancer through through the induction of upper back. So uh, that's a definitely very interesting question. And all of this goes through interferon response, and that's why the kind of usage of interferon, uh, even in medicine, became quite an interesting question because it can be also good and bad. Okay, so what are other things? So about viruses, yeah, I guess I just talked about viruses. How do you spell the family of enzymes AID? So, uh, so AID is activated activation induced deaminase. So deaminase, it's this uh, ability, this chemical ability of these enzymes is deamination uh, of cytosine, for example, to uracil. So AID comes from activation induced deaminase. But the whole family includes all of these upper back enzymes. Yeah, so that's the thing. So, so what is the effect of inability of the eukaryotic repair system to get to region to, for transcription before the start of transcription? Mm -hmm. uh, have there been any reported cancer due to delay of repair system? Yeah, so basically it's, um, it's about this transcription couple repaired. So uh, transcription couple repair. So yes, in principle, it's very important. And uh, uh, repair enzymes should be brought first to places where transcription bumps into the damaged places. And yes, uh, the, the, the problems in the specifically ability to bring repair enzymes to the place of transcription also predispose uh, patients to cancer. Because, yeah, because if, you're, if you uh, have a problem with transcription, you also can affect the level of protein. So it definitely it's a problem. Doug, okay. What uh, can you do to get into cancer research? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't say that I am myself really working on cancer research. Like, I'm, I'm not myself studying cancer. But uh, I believe that there's a whole area of biomedical research that is related to cancer etiology. And I feel that cancer etiology starts from very basic research, from understanding of basic mechanisms that are protecting us from cancer. So uh, I actually spent my whole life working uh, in using model organisms. So we started with from yeast, but right now actually what we are doing is that we're studying a very basic process in yeast and applying them to human cells. For example, we're finding specific patterns of uh, some interesting mechanisms that we think might be contributing to cancer in yeast and specifically looking for those patterns in mammalian genomes in relation to cancer. I think that the base, the, in order to get into cancer research, it's important to get into science and to get a basic education there. And I think 
my own take on that is starting from model organisms at least during your education is extremely good way to go and then later on yeah you can get to real cancer research if you would like to but i think understanding of basic mechanisms is very important i mean the word you keep saying up i mean the word you keep saying Upper Berg. Oh, no, I, it's not Upper Berg. It's Upper Berg. It's actually, somebody wrote right away, it's A-P-O-B-E-C. It's the group of enzyme, a, a group of enzymes uh, that uh, really are doing this deamination. So it's AID like enzymes. They are all deaminating cytosine to uracil. Yeah, it's this. It's uh, AID is one of the enzymes in this group. So usually AID is particular enzyme that is involved in this damination of cytosines for for in immunoglobulin genes. So it specifically helps diversification and uh, making this different immunoglo immunoglobulins with different antibodies. Apabex is a much bigger group of enzymes that specifically helps in fight of viruses. It's but they're doing very, very similar thing. Chemically, it's the same thing. So I think that is, I'm not sure if there are more. Yeah, uh, if there are, I think that's all. There are no more questions. Nope, I think you got them all, Anna. Uh-huh, yes, I think, I think, I think, I think we more or less did our stuff, right? Yeah. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. yes. If anybody else has any questions, you're more than welcome to email me and I can forward them along to Anna. Um, otherwise, I will see all of you next week um, at the same time. And again, if you have any issues or questions, be sure to email me. And thank you to Anna Malkova for the lecture today. And everybody have a good rest of your week. Okay? Yeah, thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.